Spencer, I'm one of the pastors here. And what you heard from Zach and Charlotte in that video is that every Christian has a responsibility to own the lostness in their community and also around the world. One of the things that we say here is that a disciple is someone who's following Jesus and they are helping others find and follow Jesus. And so every Christian should be asked this question at some point. What are you doing to help others find and follow Jesus? Because there is so much need here in our city. There's so much need globally. We need to be asking ourselves the question, what can I do personally to own the lostness around me? But then like they also said that the church, is lar- church at large is also responsible. And so as a church, what we also are asking is, well, what can we do as a church to push back lostness, to own the lostness around us? Well, if you are new or if you haven't been coming around very long, you need to understand that at this church, we are dead serious about doing whatever we can do to own the lostness that we see around us locally, but also nationally and globally. And the way that we do that is through our Hold the Rope offering. So pretty much every year we have a Hold the Rope offering. And what we do is we ask every person who calls Two Cities Home to give a one-time gift above and beyond their normal tithes and offering to Hold the Rope. And what we do is we end up giving 100% of this offering away to different ministries that have great need. And if you were here last week, you saw a video of Pastor Thomas West, who is pastoring a church called Redeemer Queens Park in London. And a couple weeks ago, Pastor Caleb and I, we went to visit Pastor Thomas and his team in London. And here in this picture, you'll see Pastor Thomas, his wife, Elizabeth, their two super cute kids, and then Pastor Caleb with his very British looking hat. He loves that hat. I had a hard time getting him to take it off once we got back. But, but when we were there, we were just so encouraged. You know, church planting here in the United States is hard, but it's especially hard in London. It's hard on the lead pastor. It's very hard on the wife and kids. I mean, think about it. You're in a new culture. You're trying to figure out how to fit in. Grandparents are on the other side of an ocean. And to make things worse, there's no Chick-fil-A no Chick-fil-A in London. I know mean, it sounds like a nightmare for many of you. But, but, but we came back and we were so encouraged to see all that the Lord is doing there. And we are excited as a church to next year, not only be sending them mission trip teams, but also to give to them through part of what we get from Hold the Road. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and grab those and flip to Mark chapter 14. That's where we're gonna be today. Mark chapter 14 is the longest chapter of the book. We're not gonna get through all of it today. And if you're new, what we've been doing is we've been walking through the book of Mark and looking at the teaching, preaching, and healing ministry of Jesus. And as we start chapter 14, what we're gonna see is that it starts out with a very somber and serious tone. As I was preparing this message, I just kept thinking to myself, man, this is such a serious text. It's so heavy. It's so somber. And I think this might be challenging for many of us because we as Americans, we are not a very serious people. What kind of conversations are you most comfortable having? Probably the conversations that are shallow and superficial. It's why most people aren't very comfortable talking about death, talking about dying, talking about spiritual things, because it's just so serious. But, but this passage is somber and serious, and I think that it's going to be a very timely passage for us because we are now officially in the Christmas season. And I say officially because I'm personally a traditionalist, and so I wait until after Thanksgiving to start celebrating. And I know some of you like to get a little bit ahead of yourselves. November 1st, you're starting to celebrate Christmas, but it is now officially Christmas season. Well, what are we celebrating here at Christmas? So the culture, they use Christmas as a time to see family, and that's great. And they get presents for for each other, that's fine. You sort of do a reset before the new year. All that stuff's great. What we are celebrating as Christians is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We are celebrating that Jesus Christ was born. Well, why was he born? He was born so that he could eventually step into the betrayal that we're gonna see starting here in Mark 14. Now, if you've been in church for any amount of time, you know that a big player in the betrayal of Jesus is Judas. Now, this, is, this chapter is gonna be the first time that Judas is mentioned, except for Mark chapter three, and he was just briefly mentioned. And as we look at Judas, what I want you to think is not how could Judas have done such a thing? I would never do something like Judas did in in that he betrayed Jesus. But what, what I want you to think is, how can I see some parts of Judas inside of me? Because we're gonna see that, that Judas struggles with a lot of the same things that you and I struggle with. 
And what's funny is we like to find things in common with Peter and Paul and James and, and those guys, but not Judas. I mean, when's the last time that you heard someone named after Judas? Probably never. We love to name people after, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all those guys, but not Judas. But in Mark 14, Mark 14 what we're going to see is we're going to see a picture of devotion and we're going to see a picture of deception. Mark 14, we are going to see legitimate Christianity, true Christianity, and then we're also going to see a picture of counterfeit Christianity. And as we're going to see here, counterfeit Christianity can sometimes be hard to spot. And so let's look together. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. It says this. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, Jesus, by stealth and kill him. For they said... Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And so we'll stop here. So we are now in the last week of Jesus' life, and we are told that it's two days before Passover. What that means is that it is busy in Jerusalem. We know that there were probably around 2 million people in the city at this time. And so if you're trying to picture this, just think of the North Carolina State Fair if you've been there. Lots of people, lots of games, lots of food, lots of activities, lots of kids, lots of smells. Very busy. So it's two days before Passover, and we're also told that the chief priests and scribes are trying to figure out how to kill Jesus quietly. Well, you might say, well, why quietly? Well, since G by this point of Jesus' ministry, he had become very popular. And so the last thing these guys wanted to do was, was kill Jesus with all these people in town and start a big riot. And so they're trying to kill Jesus quietly. Let's, see, let's keep going, verse three. And while he, Jesus, was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. There's so much here to talk about, but I'm just going to point out three things. First, we see that Jesus is in the house of Simon the leper. Now, during that time period, as many of you know, if, if someone had leprosy, you couldn't eat in, ha in the house with them. But what most commentators think is that at this point or by this time, Jesus had actually healed Simon the leper. And so a more appropriate way to describe him would have been Simon the leper or Simon the ex-leper or maybe Simon the healed. But aren't we too quick ourselves to judge people or to label people by who they used to be? It's not helpful. And so we see that Jesus is in the house of Simon the leper. The second thing we see is that a woman comes and she pours perfume on Jesus' head. Now, we know from other gospel accounts that the woman who does this is Mary, who is the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who not long before this, Jesus had, risen, had raised from the dead. And so this is Mary, and it says that she poured very expensive perfume on Jesus' head. Mark goes out of his way to communicate that this is very expensive stuff. He says that this perfume is worth at least 300 denarii, which would have been a year's wages. And so today, you know, picture someone having a, a bottle of perfume worth $50,000 and then breaking it and pouring it on someone's head. That's what's going on here. It's a lot of money. And what Mary does here, it, it makes you wonder, why do we not do extravagant things for Jesus like this? Why do we not do things for Jesus? Why do we not make, rest, make sacrifices for Jesus that are hard for people to understand? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons, but one reason is because it's costly. Doing extravagant things for Jesus tends to be expensive. It's expensive financially, it's expensive relationally, it's expensive with time. But it also might be that we're, we're afraid that we are going to get the same response that Mary gets here, which is the third thing we see, that some were indignant or angry, and they scolded Mary. They said, why did, we sell, why, did we, why did you do this? Why could we not have just sold this perfume and given the money to the poor? What's so interesting here is that in the Gospel of John, we are actually told which one of the disciples spoke up to scold Mary. Guess which one it was? Judas. And John is also very specific when talking about Jesus, but Judas, because the question is, well, why is Judas upset? John actually tells us that the reason that Judas was upset is not because he cared about the poor. The reason Judas was upset is because he was a thief. 
And we know that Judas was in control of the disciples' money bag. And so what that meant is that since he was a thief, he was figuring out ways to slowly, creatively, over time, steal money. And in view of this text, I feel the need to ask, is this you? Are you a thief? How do people steal today? Most people today don't steal by creating big Ponzi schemes or stealing people's iPhones or going to rob banks. We, we tend to be much more careful and discreet today with stealing. What about using your company credit card when you shouldn't? What about not scanning every item at the self-checkout in the grocery store? What about stealing time, billing, billing more hours than you're actually working? Or maybe you're intentionally working less hours than you're being paid for? Last night after the 5 p.m. service, I had an older man walk up to me and he said, you know, sometimes at work, I'll be, I'll feel tempted to take some small things. And I feel like I have a little voice in my head that's telling me, it's okay. It's not a big deal. But, but I know that this is a specific temptation for me. A buddy of mine that I went to college with, he doesn't go to this church. He lives in Eastern North Carolina. He's got two young kids, and he told me last week, he said, at my church, we were doing a diaper drive for a pregnancy care center, and he said, I was, I was tempted to steal some of the diapers. He said, but I didn't, and I thought, this is exactly the kind of thing that we are tempted to do. Nothing drastic, no, you know, we're not creating big Ponzi schemes, but little compromises where we are tempted to steal. We are tempted to be thieves. Judas was a thief. And so what we see is that Mary pours expensive perfume on Jesus' hair. Judas scolds her. Now let's see how Jesus responds. Let's look together at verse six. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So what Mary had done here seemed to be totally wasteful. I mean, think about it. It would have been pointless for Mary because she, at this point, she didn't really need anything from Jesus. He had just raised her brother from the dead. And now she was out of a big expensive bottle of perfume. And then it was also pretty pointless for Jesus. I mean, this perfume would have lasted a day or two anyway. And who was Jesus trying to impress? But what Jesus says here is he says, what Mary has done for me is beautiful. She has done a beautiful thing for me. Because what she has done is she has given us a picture of how worthy and valuable Jesus is. Mary is giving us a picture of gratitude and worship. What worship is, is worship is just responding rightly to who God is. That's all worship is. And so when we gather together and we sing, what we're doing is we are responding rightly to who God is. Whenever you give generously, what you're doing is you're responding rightly to who God is. But what Judas is doing here is he's doing the exact opposite. Judas does not respond rightly. And what we are seeing is a really clear contrast between Judas and Mary. Because Mary over here, she is willing to forfeit her wealth for Jesus. Judas is willing to forfeit Jesus for wealth. Mary is a giver. Judas is a taker. Mary loves Jesus. Judas loves money. Mary is generous. Judas is critical and he's hypocritical. He's critical of Mary. He's hypocritical before God. And what we see here is that Jesus is not having Judas's critical spirit. J Jesus looks at Judas and says, leave her alone. Because what Judas is trying to do here is he's trying to rain on Mary's parade. Mary is, Mary is trying her best to show others how valuable and worthy Jesus is, and Judas is trying to dampen it. And so one of the things that we say here is we as a church, we want to be a full of, we want to be a church full of people who have critical minds, but not critical hearts. Yes, we want to think critically about things. We want to analyze things well, but we don't want to do things with a critical spirit like we see here in the life of Judas. And then we also see in verse nine that Jesus says that Mary's legacy forever is going to be a love for him. And when you think about what kind of legacy you want to leave, is that not it? I mean, what sounds better to you? Yeah, he really just loved Jesus and loved his family. Or 
yeah, he just really loved money and he was willing to sacrifice a lot of things for it. Well, obviously, we would much rather be known for someone who, as someone who just loves Jesus. And so Mary and Judas, they give us a vision and they give us a counter vision here. Now, let's see what Judas does next, picking up in verse 10. It says this. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. <coughs> Excuse me. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Two things here. First thing we see is that Judas is going out of his way to betray Jesus. It says he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now, it's one thing to sin. It's one thing to, to mess up. But it's an entirely different thing for sin to be totally premeditated, for, ten to be to, for, for sin to be totally planned. This is the guy who is, who is planning on his wife leaving in a couple hours so that he can get on some websites that he shouldn't. This is the girl who is, in, is planning to dress in a way that's provocative in order to attract a guy's attention. This is the guy who's making all sorts of plans on Friday night and he's rearranging his entire weekend because he plans on drinking too much on Friday night. There's something uniquely evil about seeking opportunities to sin. And so that's the first big idea. The second thing we see is that Judas was willing to sell Jesus out for a price. Now, when we read this text, Judas betraying Jesus is honestly pretty terrifying for multiple reasons. One of the reasons it's terrifying is that Judas was thought of as being a trustworthy guy. How do we know that? Well, like I said earlier, we see in other parts of the scripture that Judas was elected to carry, them, carry the money bag for the disciples. If, if he were thought of as being some sketchy guy, they probably wouldn't have voted him money bag holder. I mean, w- would you pick the sketchy guy to do your taxes? I hope not. But for some reason, when we think of Judas, we like to think of Judas as being this clearly sketchy guy who's doing all these things that are just a little bit dark. You know, we, we picture Judas telling inappropriate jokes when Jesus is not around. We picture Judas going to skip class and to vape with his friends. We, we picture Judas as cheating at card games. But that is not how Judas was thought of. He was clearly thought of as being trustworthy. And then the second thing that's terrifying about Judas is that he had been in the inner circle with Jesus for three years. Three years he had been with Jesus the entire time. And so here's what that means. Jesus was Judas's community group leader. Jesus discipled Judas. Whenever Judas had a question about theology, he didn't have to Google it. He didn't have to go ask anybody else. He could just ask Jesus. When Jesus gave his sermon on the Mount, Judas was right there, listening to it in person. When Jesus fed the 5,000 and he used the disciples to do it, the miracle was happening in the hands of Judas. Judas was taking the bread and the fish to people. And so when, when you see Judas betray Jesus, it just makes you ask the question, well, how on earth could this have happened? How is it possible that he could have spent three years with Jesus and, and betrayed him like this? Well, there's two reasons that I could think of. The first, we're gonna talk about this later, is that Judas was never actually a Christian. And that brings up another big question. How is it possible to spend three years with Jesus Christ and not become a Christian? And the answer to that is, we don't know. It's a mystery. It's something we just are not able to understand. But here's what I do know. In a room this size, there are many of you who have wayward children, children who are not walking with the Lord. Maybe you have a sibling who's not a Christian or a best friend who's not a Christian and you just beat yourself up over it. It just breaks your heart. You think, well, maybe we should have sent them to a different school. Maybe we should have paid a little bit more money to send them to a Christian school. Maybe we should have sent them to a different church so they could have had more Christian friends. We should have done more of this. We should have done less of this. We should have had more devotional time as a family. In view of what we see with Judas in this text, I think that you need to hear this. Number one, could you have done some things differently? Sure. But you did the best you could with where you were. And even Jesus lost one. I mean, think about it. Did Judas have good Christian friends? Oh, yeah. Did Judas have a good Christian teacher? Yeah. His teacher was Jesus. It doesn't get any better. Jesus. 
And so if you are here and you are heartbroken over a child who is not walking with the Lord, you need to understand that Jesus knows exactly how you feel because one of the 12 wasn't a disciple or wasn't a Christian. And so that's one reason that, that Judas betrayed Jesus. He wasn't a Christian. The second reason that we're going to see is that Judas had a price. A reason that he betrayed Jesus is he had a price. Do you have a price? I was thinking about this a lot this week, and I, I asked a friend of mine who just got a brand new puppy. I asked him this. I said, let's, let's say for some reason, just, just bear with me here. Let's say that someone offered you $25 million to very gently and compassionately have that puppy put to sleep, would you do it? And he thought about it for a second and he took a deep breath and he said, I would do it. I would do it. I'd feel bad about it, but I'd do it. He heard me say this earlier and he wanted me to share with you all that he's, he's like, remind them that I said I would buy a new puppy. Okay, communicated. <laughs> but, but, but after he said that, I was like, okay, fair enough. $25 million is a lot of money. But I said, well, what about $25? Would you do it for $25? And he said, no, of course not. I thought, okay. Well, what we had established in that moment is that he had a price for which he would do something terrible. It's just a matter of what that price was. And so my question to you is, is what is your price? Now, again, I'm, what I'm not, I'm not asking, I'm not saying, you know, some of you are willing to actually sell Jesus out and recant your faith or renounce your faith for a price. That's not what I'm asking. But what I am saying is, do you have areas of your life where your commitment to Jesus stops? For some of you, you are committed to Jesus until it's just not convenient anymore. Over the last 10 years, I have seen far too many college students be very, implug, be very plugged into the church, be very plugged into a college ministry. They're coming to all the events because it's very convenient. But then they move to a different city and it's, it's not as convenient anymore and they just, they just fall away. Some of you, you might be very committed to Jesus until somebody gets sick or until you get sick. Some of you are committed to Jesus until you want to live with your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance before you get married. But that's where your commitment stops. Like, I'm not committed enough to actually walk away from this. Some of you are committed to Jesus until you feel convicted about giving 10% of your income to the kingdom of God. In view of what we see with Judas here, in view of how he sells Jesus out, we need to ask ourselves, at what point does my commitment to Jesus stop and I sell him out. This is why we need accountability. This is why we need community. We need people to help us with this. This is why we need to be praying and asking God to help us. In Psalm 19, David says, Lord, would you keep your servant back from presumptuous sins? Let them not have dominion over me. We need help from God and we need help from each other. Let's go to verse 12. It says this, and on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared Passover. Now, we're not going to spend very long here, but what we see when, when Jesus tells them to go find a guy in the city who's carrying a jar of water, it's very similar actually to what we see in chapter 11 when he tells the disciples to go into the city and find a colt that's tied up and bring it to him. And the big idea that we need to understand here is that Jesus is in total control as he is about to be betrayed. And so as, as you see Jesus betrayed, you need to think this, Jesus is sovereign, he is not surprised. When you think about your life right now and whatever it is you're going through, you need to understand Jesus is sovereign, he is not surprised. People love to just spin in circles all day asking this question, is God in control or is man responsible? Well, good news, two things can be true at once. God is in control, God is sovereign, and man is responsible. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are compatible in ways that are hard for us to understand. 
And so what that means is that Jesus being betrayed by Judas was part of God's redemptive plan. God planned it. But at the same time, Judas is going to act on his own free will. And as we're going to see here, he's going to be held accountable for his actions. And if you have any questions about the sovereignty of God versus man's responsibility, Pastor Dave afterwards would love to talk with you. He'll be, he'll be just out front. Verse 7, verse 17 rather. Jesus, so, so Jesus and the disciples, they're at the Passover meal together. And it says this. And when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the son of man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. So, so a very lash, harsh sentence there from Jesus. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. There are a few things to notice here. First, we notice that Jesus doesn't tell the disciples exactly who's going to betray him. Did you notice that? And the reason that he does this is because he wants his disciples to examine their own hearts and ask themselves, is it me? Am I capable of doing this? When Jesus asked this, you would think that either one of two things would happen. Either they would say, it's Judas. I've had my suspicions. Or you would think that they would look at Peter and be like, it's got to be Peter. He has a way of messing up everything. But, but neither of those two things happen. And then what Jesus does, he gives the disciples some heavy news. He says, it would be better for the person who is going to betray me if they had never been born at all. And this one sentence lets us know a couple things. It lets us know that Judas was not a Christian. It lets us know that Judas is in hell. And it lets us know that hell is permanent. And in Matthew chapter 26, we're actually given another clue or just another just glimpse into this scene that helps us make a little bit more sense. So in Matthew 26, we're told that Jesus tells his disciples, one of you is going to betray me. And it says that they go around and, and they all say this, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? No. Is it I, Lord? No. And then it says we get to Judas. And Judas looks at Jesus and he says this, is it I, Rabbi? Hmm, interesting. You see, the reason that Judas was not a Christian is because he never acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord. He only viewed him as a teacher. And in a room this size, I have to wonder, are any of you in that boat? You might be in here. You grew up in a Christian home. You like coming to church. You enjoy singing the songs. You, you, you can say the right things. You sometimes lift your hands when we, when we worship. All that stuff's great. You love that your kids are here, your grandkids are here because they're, they're getting a good sense of morality and that's great. But at the end of the day, Jesus is, is not really Lord of your life. He's not really in control. He, he's just a teacher. I heard a pastor, he was talking about this idea of, of Judas and being, you know, viewing someone as, as Lord instead of teacher. And he said, one of the things we learn in the life of Judas is you can't, you, um, you can't lose your salvation, but you can fake it. You can't lose your salvation, but you can fake it. We know as we look at the scriptures that you cannot lose your salvation. Salvation is when God sovereignly speaks life into someone that was dead. And so you can't lose your salvation, but you can certainly lose your assurance of salvation. And I'm sure there are many of you in here who have friends or family members who, who you, you would say, I was sure at one point in my life that they were a Christian, but now they're not walking with the Lord. What about them? Like, how do I make sense of this? I just knew this person was a Christian. We used to go to all these things together and, and it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, this is actually a very personal topic to me. So about a month ago, I was talking to um, an old roommate of mine from UNC Chapel Hill. I love this guy. We don't talk very often now, but we have a great relationship. And this guy, um, we lived together for two years. We used to go to church together. I was sitting beside him when he decided to get baptized. I watched him get baptized. We went to church together. We had lots of spiritual conversations together. 
But recently I heard that he was doing some things that I found a little bit worrisome. And so I reached out to him and I was like, hey man, how are things going? You know, just wanted to check in, you know, just help me understand this. And he, and he said to me, he said, he said, hey man, you know, I think it would be helpful for me to tell you that I don't identify as a Christian anymore. I identify as agnostic. And I hear this and I'm just like, man, how do I process this? And as I was thinking about it, I, you know, I could really think that there are really only one of two options for my friend. Number one, he either actually is a Christian, he's just lost his assurance of salvation because of the lifestyle he's been living. Or the second possibility is that he was never a Christian in the first place. He was just faking it. Counterfeit Christianity, as we see in the life of Judas, it can be hard to spot, especially here in the Bible Belt. Now let's pick back up in verse 22. So we know at this point, as we jump into verse 22, that Judas had actually just left the dinner to betray Jesus. And it says this, and as they were eating, he, Jesus, took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What's happening here is called the institution of the Lord's Supper. And what we're going to see is that the Lord's Supper or communion, it is a tradition that is connected back to the Passover meal. And the Passover meal is a tradition that is connected back to the Passover that we see in Exodus chapter 12. Now, the problem with traditions is that we often forget their meaning. I mean, think about it. What is Halloween for most of us? It's a tradition without a meaning. What about St. Patrick's Day? You know, they've got lots of traditions. Well, for most of us, it's a tradition without a meaning. We would have to Google it to know the meaning. Well, what if someone had come up to you before at the service and said, could you explain to me very simply, in one to two minutes, what is the meaning of communion? What is the meaning of the Lord's Supper? It's, it's an important question because we need to understand the meaning. So to understand it, we have to go all the way back to Exodus. So many of you know that in the book of Exodus, what is happening is that the people of Israel are slaves in Egypt. And Moses goes to Pharaoh on behalf of God and he says, let my people go. Pharaoh says no. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And what God does, he sends nine plagues throughout Egypt. And Pharaoh still has a hard heart. And so what God does next is, is he says, all right, I'm going to send a 10th plague called the Passover. And God tells Moses, he says, what I'm gonna, or so what's going to happen is that the firstborn son in every household is going to die overnight unless that family takes a spotless lamb and kills it and spreads the blood on the doorposts. And for those families, for the families who have faith in the God of the Bible and a substitute, a lamb, God's wrath is going to pass over their house and the firstborn is going to be spared. What's also really interesting about Exodus chapter 12 is you can look and you will see that God gives lots of description about what the Passover meal should look like. He, he explains to them what the Passover meal needs to look like before the Passover even happens. And the reason he does this is because the meal itself is going to be important and he does not want the people to forget how he rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And so what's happening in Mark 14 is Jesus is at the Passover meal with his disciples and he takes the bread and he gives it to his disciples. He says, this is my body. He takes the wine, he gives it to him. He says, this is my blood. And what he is doing here is he is making a 1500 year old tradition about himself. And this would have been shocking to the disciples because Jesus is basically saying in the same way that the Passover meal is meant to remind you of how God saved you from slavery, the Lord's Supper from here on out is going to be how you remember me. And then we are given the Lord's Supper or communion. Now in a room this size, I'm sure that you are all over the map when it comes to your experience in the past with the Lord's Supper. Some of you, you grew up in a church where you did not do communion very often. You might've done it once a month. You might've done it once a quarter. Last night after the 5 p.m., I had a lady come up to me and she said, the church that I grew up, grew up in, we did communion once and never. So, okay, some of you may have done communion once and never growing up. 
You know, this, this tends to be uh, Baptist churches. It tends to be Methodist churches sometimes. It tends to be charismatic churches. This was my experience. I grew up in a small Southern Baptist church of less than 100 people, and I can remember about once a quarter, they would pass around the silver trays, and we would have the little cups with juice in them, and they would give us the little cracker that was stale and seemed older than I was, and, and we would just take it, and it wasn't a huge deal, but that's what we did. And so that was some of your experiences, but some of you grew up Lutheran or Anglican or Presbyterian, and you may have taken communion every week. Some of you grew up Catholic, and you received the Eucharist every week from a priest. It, it was a big deal for you. And the Catholic Church, they hold to a position called transubstantiation, which is a big word. But transubstantiation is basically the belief that during communion, the bread and the wine become the literal and actual body and blood of Christ. Now, here at this church, we believe that all of Scripture is meant to be taken literally. But there's two kinds of literal. There's actual literal, and there's figurative literal. And so, for example, let's say I were to go over to the kids' building, grab my one-year-old daughter, Emma, bring her over here, and say, Emma, you are just so cute. I could just eat you up. Now, if you heard me say that, would any of you call Child Protective Services and be like, this pastor at two cities is threatening to eat his child? No, of course not. I'm speaking figuratively. Well, what about examples from Jesus? Jesus also says, I am the vine, you are the branches. But Jesus doesn't have leaves. Jesus says, I am the door. But Jesus doesn't have hinges. And we, we see in the book of Romans that, that Paul says that we are bab baptized with him unto death. But if you have been baptized here as a believer, in case you didn't know this, you did not actually literally die. And so what we believe here is that when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, is that he is speaking figuratively. And even though Jesus is not actually present in the bread and the juice, the Holy Spirit is present in his people during communion. And we believe here that communion is a very sacred time where we are called to remember the cross and to remember what God has done for us on our behalf. And so what Jesus is doing is he is saying, the Passover is ultimately about me. He's saying the Lord's Supper is going to be how you remember me. And there's one final detail that as I was studying this passage, I, I noticed that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to share with you as we wrap things up here is that at every Passover meal, there would normally be four things. There may have been more than this, but certainly not less than this. Every Passover meal, there would be bread, there would be wine, there would be herbs, and there would be lamb. In Mark 14, if you'll notice, there is no mention of a lamb at all. There's no mention of meat, which is sort of strange because, you know, it's, it's a big part of the meal. It's, it's, it's the meat. And you might think, well, maybe it's mentioned in one of the other accounts. Nope, you can look in Matthew, you can look in John, you can look in Luke. There's no mention of a lamb. And you might say, well, maybe the disciples are vegetarians. I don't think so. Probably not the case. Well, what is happening at this meal is, and the reason that this is the case is because Jesus Christ is himself the lamb. He is saying, I am the lamb of God. I am here. You see, in the Old Testament, what would happen is, is that the wrath of God would pass over the house of anyone who had sacrificed a lamb who was a spotless, innocent substitute. Does that sound familiar at all? Because here, here today... Any person who has faith in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who was a spotless, innocent substitute, will be spared from the wrath of God. You see, the heart of the gospel is put on display here at the Last Supper, here with communion. And the heart of the gospel can be summarized with this one word, substitution. A couple weeks ago, when I was in London, Pastor Caleb and I were on a Christian heritage tour. And one of my best friends, JT, and his wife, Caroline, they were on this tour as well. And it was really cold this morning. It was like 40 degrees. We were in the shade. We were listening to the tour guide. JT was standing right beside me. His wife, Caroline, was standing on the edge of the group. And as I was listening to the tour guide, I noticed that the wind started to blow just out of nowhere, just really hard from one direction. And as I was listening to the tour guide, I, I noticed that JT had slipped off from beside me and he had walked back around his wife, Caroline, and he stood behind her so that the wind would hit him and then it would pass over her and she wouldn't be cold. 
And I, I saw this happen and I just thought, this is just a small picture of the gospel. Because in the same way that JT shielded Caroline from the cold wind, what Jesus Christ has done for us is he has shielded us from the wrath of God by becoming our representative substitute. He has done this by receiving the wages of our sin in our place. And so if you're in this room and you're a Christian, you need to understand that Jesus Christ did not just die for you. Jesus Christ died instead of you. And what we do during communion is we remember what Christ has done for us on our behalf. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you need to view this passage as a warning and an invitation. It's a very serious warning. Jesus gives us the verdict on what happens to someone who does not acknowledge him at Lord. It says that he would have been better to have never been born. So it's a harsh verdict, but at the same time, it's a very generous invitation. Because what Jesus Christ does is he holds up the bread and he says, take. And if you're not a Christian right now, what he is doing is he is offering to you right now his gift of salvation for free. He, he just says, you have to receive it. Forgiveness, acceptance, adoptance, adopt, being adopted by God is something that is given to those who have faith and who repent. May we be a church that is full of people who is quick to remember our great substitute, the Lamb of God who stood in our place. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the cross. I thank you that you became our substitute. You paid the price we couldn't pay with your life. Father, help us to remember we are a forgetful people. We are so quick to forget what you have done for us, what you have done on behalf of us. And so I pray that you would help us to remember how you have pursued us, how you love us, how you forgive us. Father, I pray that for those in this room who have never received you, that they would just see your forgiveness that you offer to them right now in a new way. Father, help us to endure. Help us to finish well. Help us to stay faithful to you until the end. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.